Hello and welcome to The Actor and the Engineer. My name is Paul James. I'm the actor. My name is Josh Knapp. I'm the broadcast engineer. Here we go, Josh. All right, we got another Ryan Johnson movie. So this uh, this week we're talking about uh, Ryan Johnson's new film, Knives Out. It's a whodunit about a Southern detective who's hired to figure out if there was foul play in the death of a rich mystery writer, which is a little bit meta, I guess, like murder mystery author. Um, he's got a big family. They've all got different reasons that they might have wanted to kill him. And so Daniel Craig swoops in with a Southern accent and tries to figure it out. So, <laughs> so have you, do, do you, do you, have you watched a lot of whodunits or, I mean, I, I recently rewatched uh, Murder on the Orient Express, the old one. We saw the one, the Kenneth Branagh one, but it's, I fell asleep in the middle of it. So I don't know what that means, but <laughs> I watched the older one and I didn't fall asleep in the middle of it. So that, I mean, that says good things about it. The, uh, the one where Albert Finney plays Poirot. So what about you? Yeah, I like those kind of movies. Um, I have seen the original Murder on the Orient Express. Uh, I've seen Murder on the Nile. Oh, Death on the Nile. I haven't seen that. Death on the Nile. Yeah. It's, it's um, not on, it's yeah, not on I streaming, mean, it, which sucks. It's one of those things where once you've seen it, it's kind of hard not to figure it out immediately mm. so that was what was fun about knives out and i was a big hardy boys fan and i was a big nancy drew fan i read all those books mm -hmm. you could not get me to read a textbook but give me something with 39 steps and some fog and i was in man i was all about it but um yeah so yeah i've seen all of those when i was younger and i like the whole mustache twirling characters that we get i like the whole intrigue i like the backstories and, and, and Ryan Johnson does it right. It's hard pressed for me to not find something positive in that man. I'm a huge fan of his. I will be behind him when they finally come out 25 years from now and tell everybody uh, that The Last Jedi was brilliant and genius and masterful and everybody else will will bow down to me saying it um, along with, you know, quite a few people. But there's been backlash with that. But they're wrong because that movie's brilliant and he's a brilliant director. Here's what I like about the we talked about supporting characters last week with Ford versus Ferrari. This is a movie of supporting characters, basically, with the exception of a lead character who you don't really know is going to be the lead until they're the lead. And then Daniel Craig. The thing that I like is they're well etched out characters, but you learn stuff about them. Character development is based on what you need from them from this narrative. I like that. You learn what you need to know about Tony Collette's character that's important to this plot line. You learn what's important about Jamie Lee Curtis's character, who's fantastic in this. It's not, not surprising. You learn everything you need to know. And I like that. I like to know stuff about characters that are important to the narrative that I'm watching now. Yes, I like a backstory. Yes, I love a subplot. Yes, I love some kind of twisted psychological problem that somebody's working out throughout the movie that was caused in childhood and then maybe solved somehow by falling in love or getting help or whatever the solution of the conflict is. Sometimes that's a little draining on my psyche. This time it's good because you learn stuff about people and their backstories, but it's relevant to what you need to know for this movie. So yes, I love the old whodunit movies. Yes, I love this movie. I had a blast. Yeah, me too. I, uh, Steph and I went and saw it last night and, uh, and she's, She's been, I don't know, recently she's been like, oh, you could just go see those movies yourself. But then when I showed her this trailer like a month ago, she's like, oh, I, I definitely want to go see that. So, and I think she, she really enjoyed it too, but just from us talking afterwards. But yeah, it's, I enjoyed it a lot. I thought that it, it kind of like went through a bunch of different, a bunch of different paths for me once I, once we got into the movie. And like you said, there's, there's somewhat of a, well, there's definitely a, a a kind of a reveal way early, and it and it went in a different way. In some ways, it seemed like kind of a, an anti murder on the Orient Express, uh, and and so I I kind of clocked that and I was like, oh, he's subverting the genre, and just the fact that the the fact that the off the the guy who was killed is number one. He's a he's a murder mystery author, so that adds a a, a layer to it. And number two, usually the person who's killed is a bad person, but we don't see anywhere in there in this movie where the the character played by 
Christopher Plummer, Harlan Thrombey is necessarily like a bad guy that that everybody would want to kill for good reasons. Uh, I mean, so so I, I think that that's a, a somewhat also a subversion of the of the genre. It's usually like a really nasty person who gets killed, and you're like, well, no, no wonder they wanted to kill kill that person. But in this in this movie, it's kind of like everybody, all all of the you know the rogues gallery of of characters that that are left there, the the family members, they're the ones who are the just that you could easily see any one of them doing it. Uh, for for the various reasons that they that they tried out, so uh, I don't know. I I think that that helped to delay the kind of expected payoff that you would get. It it sets you at least it set my mind at ease. I wasn't trying to to clock all the things that uh, that Daniel Craig's character in this movie, the character's name is Benoit Blanc, and uh, he's I guess he's from like New Orleans or something. He's Creole or I don't know. It's some. I mean, obviously it's like a French name, but it's but he's from somewhere in the South, so I would guess it would be a French American name from Louisiana or something. I don't know, but uh, so yeah, I also started to notice. I don't think we're getting into spoilers just yet, but but the big thing that I noticed notice is that. With especially with the Poirot stuff that I've seen, we're always behind the the main detective Poirot, or in this case, it's Blanc. But you get the feeling in this movie that we're ahead of of Blanc, uh, and and so that's that's what that's what's interesting and different ab- about this. But Ryan Johnson keeps it interesting, and he pulls you along. It it feels like, well, I guess he pushes you along. He doesn't necessarily pull you along. It's not like you're kicking and screaming being drug along by the director or by the storyteller <laughs> he's he's kind of like prodding you along a, as you go on and this movie's funny and it has obviously great great acting in it and um the the only thing that i would say that didn't land very well for me was the score did it did did you notice anything weird with the score did you did, did you notice the score cuz if you didn't notice the score that's good um, I remember one time it was like, dum, 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 and I was like, whoa, calm no, down, that's more calm like, down. Is that's this more like sound design or something? I, not sound design, but I don't know. That's, that's okay, more well, like. I didn't like that, whatever that was. Yeah, I thought it was yeah, the part of the effect. soundtrack where I saw the, uh, thought, um, part of the score where it was going along and then oh, it maybe. emphasized something. I don't know. Um, hmm. So no, I didn't really notice it. If you're talking about what I just mentioned, then yes, it stuck out. But it was just like, whoa, that's just a little much right now for hmm. where we're at in this film. But what I didn't know at the time was that you're going to find out, you know, a third of the way in who who did it, yeah. basically. And then it's it's about something else after that. So that might be why there was such a overemphasis of that sound design or that part of the score. But no, it doesn't. Like I said, those kind of things. I've said this before. I don't know why they don't stick out to me. But when they do, it's either because they irritated the hell out of me or because it was so beautiful that it would not escape me. But you really have an ear for that kind of stuff. I mean, you're a musician. Um, your ears kind of twisted that way you're a drummer so you're twisted in a way that only <laughs> drummers are um drummers are a breed apart dude um i try to whisper that like you're not going to hear it yeah totally didn't hear that only the only the people who are listening heard it and not me <laughs> <laughs> Shh, it's our secret people um so no it didn't stick out but what didn't you like about it 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 seemed i it definitely had kind of like a jazz type feel but it it seemed a little disjointed to me and i guess i just was expecting something different and it didn't feel like it bolstered either any of the characters or any of the 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 moods that that the filmmaking was uh, that i felt the filmmaking was was trying to set up it didn't seem like it supported uh in it, it for me because i noticed it, it 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 detracted from what was going on but I think the the filmmaking in general, the the shot selection, and a lot of the there's there's a lot of foreground uh, items being used, and you don't see that much right now. I think you you see a lot of things where like there may be something uh, accented in the background where you have a character in 
you know, in the center of the frame and something's accident in the background. We see that all the time. But there's a lot of camera movement, a lot of dollying side to side and revealing an item in the foreground. It's usually out of focus, but it's it's in the foreground, whether it's a dagger or whether it's something on the desk, uh, uh, like on uh, Throm- Thromby's desk or any any kind of like they're they're calling it uh, Ryan Johnson's calling attention to a particular item and in some ways it's kind of overt but it's in a way that we don't I at least I don't remember seeing at least with, with uh, more recent films but now maybe that has uh I mean Ryan Johnson is a student of film so he may that may be a a straight homage to a particular film or group of films or film filmmaking style but uh, I I noticed it, but once again, I noticed it in a good way, and it felt like it was it that was was helping us as an audience to to focus in, in a way. But I, I don't know. You you can do it a couple different ways. If you want to get the audience to focus on something, you can have a cut shot of a close up of that item. But he didn't do that necessarily. He would he would bring that item into the foreground of an established shot with the with the main character who's in the center of the frame. And I think that's helping the film to seem a little bit more lyrical and then and and keep the motion going and focused on the characters, but then also bringing in those items, those non-actor items in into the consciousness of the of the film watcher. So, I thought that was was really cool. Are you ready to get into spoilers? Sure. Okay. Well, uh so I my opinion is it's it's a fun movie to see in the theater. I don't want to take any food out of Ryan Johnson's mouth, but I think that this film would play really well as a rental if you're, you know, if you can't make it out to the theater. It would play really well as a rental and and you would get a a lot out of the film uh as a rental. It but there the humor that's in this film, it was interesting to see how many people laughed at what things because there were certain laughs that everyone laughed at. There were certain ones that half of the theater laughed at. And there are certain jokes that only like one or two or three people laughed at. And that was interesting. And that's something you're not going to get if you watch it on Netflix or whatever streaming service it's going to be on uh, six months from now. Spoilers from now on, we're getting into spoilers on a whodunit film. We will talk about who murdered Harlan Thromby. I w- did not expect, first of all, I did not expect to know who actually did the murder that early in the film. You s- alluded to that earlier. And also, like you've, you also alluded to, I didn't expect Ana de Armas to be this, the, one of the stars of the film, which is really cool, especially with the trailer. Very cool. With, especially with the trailer. Very cool. And she can hold a movie like that. That And and I, I thought she was great in Blade Runner 2049. That's the first time I really saw yeah. her for an extended period of time. And I know she's in, in a new film too. She, she's in a new film coming up. Oh, well, it's a big, big movie. What is she? Oh yeah, No Time to Die. It's James Bond. So she's in, in that film. So, so yeah, it's, that's going to be, that's going to be cool too. But so uh, she's a Cuban actress, but one of those jokes that people didn't actually laugh at, that not a lot of people laughed at or didn't realize that it was a joke, is that the first time I clocked it when somebody's uh, one of the main characters says that she's from, um, not Bolivia, says that she's from Ecuador, and then the next person says she's from Paraguay, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be a running joke. And then every time... You could tell there's like a handful of people that would kind of chuckle every time a different character used a different South American country just to to emphasize the fact that they're like, we don't know where she's from. She's from somewhere down there, but she's definitely not from here. It, in some ways, it's kind of like using a scalpel instead of a sledgehammer, but Ryan Johnson definitely uses some sledgehammers in this film to to get to get out his his views on certain things, whether it's internet trolls yeah, or- you think? <laughs> yeah, or whatever. There's a few heavy-handed things that yeah. um I think are handled they're handled fine, but they are heavy-handed. But let me say something about having Marta be the character that becomes the lead character. It, it, it's 
first of all, it all comes back to Ryan Johnson, who I think is brilliant in his writing. You're not expecting it to be what you are. You hear what it is. Mm -hmm. So since Brian Johnson is uh, going to uh, be part of a love fest that I'm going to have with him on this podcast, I'm going to start with saying it all comes back to him because not only did he write his lead character as an unexpected character, he wrote it exactly how it happened. You know exactly what happened. And he tells you exactly what happens from moment one. And then to take an actress who's obviously capable of handling it. Um, she's a standout in 2049. No doubt about it. I remember her from that. I remember her eyes. And I remember a couple of moments that she had from that movie that are standouts. So she's a capable, well, capable actress. But then you have Don Johnson, one of the biggest TV slash movie stars in the world. You have Academy Award nominee Tony Collette, Academy Award nominee Michael Shannon, Academy Award winner Christopher Plummer, Jamie Lee Curtis, one of the biggest stars of all time. You have this cast that surrounds her and they become minor characters. And you're thinking how brazen and ballsy is it to take a lead character away from one of those people? Not that they would be appropriate for any of those, anything other than what they did in this movie, but nothing centralized around them. It was yeah. all around her and Daniel Craig, but still he kind of takes a back seat to some of the stuff when she's recreating the events that happened to her. And then, you know, there's a whole subplot with Chris, Chris Evans. And then you yeah. have Captain America. I think J Daniel Craig has juicy parts. Daniel Craig has things he can sink his teeth into. And Chris Evans, I kind of thought that I was like, oh, this is cool. He's like, he really likes Ryan Johnson. And, and, you know, halfway through the film, I'm like, he likes Ryan Johnson. And he kind of just kind of jumped in for a couple scenes and that's going to be it. He's going to be just kind of like the jerky grandson and, and just move on. Not a big deal, but of course his, I mean, it makes sense that, that his part grows exponentially as the film goes on, but I didn't expect it to necessarily. I would have been totally fine with him showing up, you know, a handful of times, getting in a couple jabs and then, you know, moving on. No, I kind of, after seeing these type of movies, I was like, yeah, there's more to, the meets the eye with this character. He's coming back. First of all, it's Chris Evans. Second of all, it's, it's one of those characters who repeats the state. They repeat the same scene over and over again. You don't know what that scene is, or you don't know what is the catalyst uh, the before or after part of that scene. You don't know why they're having the argument that you see over and over again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he has to come back at some point. And when he comes back, I was like, Nope, I don't trust you. I don't, I don't trust you. I don't trust you because who yells at their grandfather on their birthday party at their mm -hmm. birthday party? You know, who argues with your grandfather, you know, regardless of what the situation is, regardless of the family dynamic, you, I, I say this now and then call me after Thanksgiving, but who does stuff like that? So I knew there was something up. And then you said something earlier and, and, and I'll kind of connect it together about the Christopher Plummer character is sort of a likable character. And usually it's that character is the one that's murdered who has an, a reason to be murdered, if you will, or a reason to be taken out because of the things that they've done. I kept coming back to if this man was as good as Marta thinks he is, then why did he raise this family of people that act like this? He was neglectful. That That's that's his biggest sin, it seems like, is what they're saying. Yeah, yeah. which is a pretty big sin sure. because... He he would not do what he does when uh, the chips are down if he didn't know that they were going to act the way that they're going to act when he's gone. Yeah. He wouldn't have done it. He obviously had. And then he is smart enough or dumb enough, depending on how you look at it, to tell his grandson what he's done. So I wasn't surprised uh, Chris Evans came back. I wasn't surprised that the good looking guy is the guy that ends up being the not well-adjusted guy. I wasn't as surprised about any of that, but I, I was fascinated. And this is a whodunit thing. I was fascinated how you see the pieces of puzzle come together mm -hmm. and you see one thing click and then another thing click and then another thing click. Yeah. I, I did like how there's, once again, we talk about kind of like the meta narrative of the film where Ryan Johnson services the basic whodunit plot, but then writing on top of it, we get to see the secondary whodunit plot in front of our face without knowing that it's in front of our face. And also seeing the Benoit Blanc character go through his motions, but then we find out later on that he knew that she murdered, not murdered, but 
he knew that that she was on the hook for the death of Thrombley from the beginning because he is that good, even though we as audience goers don't realize he is that good. Now, I think that that is, if there is another Benoit Blanc story, it's not going to be called Knives Out 2, but if there is another Benoit Blanc story, then Ryan Johnson is, doesn't have the license to do that again because we know the capabilities of this character now, whereas before, we weren't really sure. We just knew he was. He had a New Yorker article about written about him. He was hired for a lot of money, which means that somebody valued his services enough to pay him a bunch of money. He's also willing to go out and do this for him, uh, being hired by someone he doesn't even know. And at the same time, when we get to see him do his thing, he isn't really... I mean, we think we see her subverting his his investigative actions at every turn so that's i mean and and it's most egregiously shown when she finds the the broken uh trellis piece and she ends up throwing it once again it's another greatly framed shot where we see him in the foreground her in the background with the dog and she just like throws the trellis piece he's talking and doing whatever he's doing not looking at her and she throws the trellis piece away and we're like it's that easy like that's all you've got to do to you know, to to fake out this Poirot dude, you know, th- this guy who's supposed to be some amazing detective, and and she's just like fumbling her way through it. Uh, so so yeah, I, I think that in in future films, if they are made, he's not going to have that luxury. Ryan Johnson's not going to have that luxury because we're going to be on guard for something like that. But it was really cool to see that double narrative. And and as the film was ending, did you do you feel like if you watch this again, you'll you'll find well, like Parasite, for example. Parasite's got all this kind of puzzle box stuff in it too, just like this film. And I watched it again a second time and there was another layer that I hadn't even gotten into the first time. And this film, I feel like he lays out that second layer in the last 20 minutes of the movie. So do you feel like this has a, a, a like repeat viewing quality like Parasite might? Yeah, well, that's a really bad comparison <laughs> because... Parasite is just perfect. And, you know, this film is really well done, but it's interesting and intriguing and trying to figure out things is a different trying to figure out things for Parasite. There's no way to know what was happening next during Parasite. No way. And even if you knew, you were not going to know ever until that maid came back. And we've talked about it a million times at this point and I have no problem with continuously talking about it but there's no way as an audience member in Parasite that you are set up to ever know that much this I think you're set up to know everything and these whodunits get a little bit wordy and complicated when the dialogue starts to get really snippy and people going back and forth and Mr. Orange did it in the uh, kitchen with a pocket knife I mean it just gets really blurry sometimes and you're trying as an audience member to, to keep up and you're trying to figure out what the significance of all of this chatter is. And Ryan Johnson has a really great way of silencing everything around the dialogue. So you're focused on the dialogue. So I think maybe we're going to figure out new things a second time we see it. But I don't think there's like this deep intellectual subplot. And it, there might be. And I don't mean to say because I didn't see it, it doesn't exist. But Subtexture is different in a movie like this than it is for me in something like Parasite. A, a, a certain color in Parasite indicates what's coming next. A certain doorway opened a certain way indicates something next. This is similar because it's a whodunit, but it's not to me as richly complex. But that's not to say that that's bad. It's just this is a different type of narrative. It's a different thing. I think what would be fun is to notice things that we didn't notice because we weren't supposed to be noticing them per se. But I actually thought that Benoit Blanc, he was smarter than all of us from moment one because there's no, as soon as you see the spot of blood on her shirt, her shoe, Mm -hmm. which is further on in the movie, but as soon as you see that, you know, it's, it's twice, you see like a close up twice. Is it when she goes home home to her mom the first time? Yeah. Yeah, which is further in the movie. You're right. You don't meet right. her. You meet her family earlier, but then you, when she goes home at that point, after all of what has happened that yeah. night, um, you find out about all that stuff. And then the camera goes down and you see that blood, 
blood stain. As soon as I saw that, I knew Benoit Blanc had seen it. Mm, I just see, knew it. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, but at the same time, you're you're right because because Ryan Johnson is is pointing the fact is pointing her shoes out throughout the film. Number one, they're white shoes. Number two, she wears them every time she's on screen. Number three, she wears those. Um, I thought they were called like pedal pushers, but they're called high cropped pants. So I googled that because I was like, are those are they pedal pushers? Are they capri pants? But they call I guess they're called high cropped pants. I don't know. But oh, pedal pushers! The bottom of your pants push along pedals as you're walking across flower beds. Is that I, what that comes from? I have no idea. I seriously don't. I know. still want to know what the hell is a culotte. Like, uh, what the hell is a culotte? I don't know either. But but you know what is there's what is that? There's definitely well, there's no way to know. But there, there's definitely space <laughs> between her shoes and her in the bottom of her pants. Is there a god? Maybe. <laughs> is there not a god? Maybe. Is there a god? Maybe. Is there a heaven? Maybe. Uh, what's a culotte? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be left till the end of time. <laughs> No one will know. We literally have the internet at our hands to nope. figure out what culottes are. But what's interesting to me is we don't know, and neither of us give enough to even press the buttons to find out. That's because correct. there's just there's a mystery of life and it's culottes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt what you were saying. No, that's fine. So Ryan Johnson's pointing all that out visually in a subtle manner, but every time you see her, you know, full body on screen, you see that that those shoes are prominently displayed and not being covered up by the cuffs of her pants or anything like that. So it gives Benoit Blanc ample time to see the the blood on her shoes. So I get that. Well, just like what you learn in a cop movie when you're supposed to clear the corners, right? You know that from watching cop movies, right? It's in The Dark Knight or it's in Batman Returns. One of the characters, I can't, uh, who is it that um, comes in and does it? I don't remember, but one of the characters walks in and Commissioner Gordon puts a gun to his head and says, clear the corners, rookie, because everybody knows that's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So as a detective, there's probably certain things that you're just supposed to do that have become part of your nature. You're supposed to look at somebody's hair. You're supposed to look at somebody's coat. You're supposed to look at their shoes. I'm not sure what that is, but I'm sure there's some kind of protocol for you to do that. And then what makes it interesting or more interesting than that is that fact that when you know he knew, he purposely didn't say anything because he needed to know where it was going to go. He didn't say anything to her at all. He yeah. knew she was involved because of that spot of blood, but said nothing to her because he needed to figure out exactly what who hired him, basically. Mm -hmm. That's the whodunit part of this. It's not the murder or the possible suicide or the drug interaction or none of that. It's the who hired him because that's the most interesting question. And always the most interesting question is one of the first ones uh, questioned or posed in movies like this. And he does say immediately in the first, what, five minutes where he says, somebody hired me, but I don't know who it is. They just an envelope of money. So right there as an audience member, you should be like, oh, but the point to that is, is that once I saw that blood, I was like, it would be hard pressed for me to not believe that he's seen it. And I was surprised that he didn't point that out to, um, 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 where's my, Keith Stanfield's character. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. It's a surprise to me that, and the other guy who was actually a standout, what was his name? Really? That actor was great. Yeah. He's in every single one of Ryan Johnson's movies. Yeah. It's, um, is he? Uh, yeah. Noah Segan. Yeah. They're buddies. You don't like him? He's fine. are they? Yeah. He's fine. I mean, he's uh, he's overacting, but you, that's that's his character. He's supposed to overact. Big fan, you know, like the whole, you know, it's just like the such and such novel. I I, I don't know. It's fine. I mean, he he serves serves a role. It's oh, he it's, is in everything, isn't he? Yeah, it's good to have it's good to have that third person. So it's not just uh, Daniel Craig and Lakeith Stanfield talking back and forth. It's good to have that kind of like doofus type character that. Yeah, but here's what here's why I think it was uh, written better than normal because usually that and that's a great way to put it that doofus character. Yes, he was doofy um, in a very adorable kind of way, but he still took the police work seriously. Mm -hmm. So when they were walking across the mud, he was like, no, 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 no. He took his job seriously. So it's not like it's not like the assistant in uh, Fargo 
where she has to keep explaining why things are working the way that they are when you should know that as a cop, you know, you should know that as a detective, you should know these things. So buffoonish, I'm all about over the top. I don't have a problem with it's when they demean what the person has earned in order to make it a comical character that starts to bother me. And I don't think they did it. I thought this guy was a standout. I thought he did a really good job of like having that position where he's nobody in the movie. Yeah. Not really. He's nobody famous for lack of a better way to put it. He's not Tony Collette. I mean, as soon as you realize you're not Tony Collette, you're pretty much (laughs) low man on the rung of the ladder. But he just, when he did his part, it's that old expression. There are no small parts, only small actors. He did it just right. He made me chuckle a couple of times. He made me laugh a couple of times when I was the only person who laughed in the the audience, which <laughs> happens to happen to me a lot. <laughs> and I'm really concerned sometimes because I, I sometimes wonder what people think my humor is. But I was surprised that Daniel Craig didn't take a second to say, hey, you know, basic detectives 101, look at people's shoes because of mm. mud, because of... Yeah. you know, deterioration, whatever it may be. And in a way, it's kind of good that they didn't do that because Ryan Johnson never talks down to the audience and that might have been perceived as talking down. But yeah, so once the blood stain was noticed, I was like, ding, ding, ding. I'm aware of what's going on here. Yeah, in some ways, in some ways, I kind of felt like it had to go somewhere else because you're right, Ryan Johnson doesn't talk down to the audience. And by the by having the whole reveal scene whatever, less than a third of the way through the film where we see her seemingly injecting Harlan with all that morphine, it seems like he's laying it out for everybody and and just trying to make it a, a, like a backwards whodunit. And, and we're looking at it on the back end, not on the front end of, of, the, of the detective, we're looking at it on the back end of someone trying to, to cover it up. It's kind of like a behind the scenes version of, of the whodunit instead of the the normal straight down the line here's your detective we're following along with the detective and he's re- revealing clues as we go along so i was in for that story to begin with but then seeing what came later made it you know gave it that that extra you know zest that extra piece to it but it it is funny because like we haven't talked very much about the the other characters, the other actors, Michael Shannon. And you talked a little bit about Michael Shannon and Tony Collette and Don Jensen, John, Don Johnson, but they, you're right. They, they put in great performances. Uh, both of the kids, you've got Catherine Langford playing Meg Thromby, who I guess she's in 13 something, something's 13 reasons why that's the Netflix show that's gotten a little maligned based on it having the suicide. Yeah. It's plot. about, yeah. Yeah, it's about a young girl who commits suicide, and you see it. It caused a big controversy, but that's yeah. like a year to two years old. Well, but now, it's been it's been multiple seasons like, of it, so I think it's every time that they release a new season, it's like a big deal. Oh, yeah, yeah. But well, it makes sense. People get un, unnerved by certain subjects. Yeah, and then uh, and she plays the the ultra liberal grand granddaughter going to college, and then Jaden Martell, who we just saw in. It and then he was also in uh, Midnight Special too, with, of course, with Michael, Michael Shannon. Shannon. Yeah. Oh, and they played his son too, so that's kind of cool. In in both oh, films, yeah. he played his son. That's neat. And so he plays the ultra right wing Nazi, is what they called him. But uh, he plays the the ultra right wing kid uh, who's always on his phone and mysteriously in the bathroom a lot. Yeah, and then we get to see. Uh, I I liked seeing Ricky Lindholm, who she's a. Uh, kind of she started in comedy she's been in a couple of films but she was the the wife of michael shannon in this film let me ask you a question really quick well first side note um she's in that much ado about nothing that joss whedon one where they filmed it yeah she's very good in that too does she say anything in this movie yes does she speak? She does, but it's I, usually in the background. It's like you can't say that to him, or or don't use that language that's in right. front she of my s- son. Or it, it's just the that's right. pearl she clutching does. character. That's that's what she is. You know, at the end of the film, when you see her again, I was like, I don't know if I think that's brilliant or lazy that he did not have her speak at all because I couldn't remember her speaking. I, I she did not 
say anything that I remembered was significant yeah. to something that I was watching. And in a way, I thought that was kind of brilliant. I thought it was brilliant because it was making a statement about her position in life as much as it. And of course, her saying the things that she does say that you reminded me that she does say, and I do remember that now, it, it makes it even clearer what her position in this family is and what her role is. And it's sad and it's demeaning and it's yeah. disgusting in a way. And it's really smart to not hit people over the head with that. No scene about her saying, not that I don't sympathize with this because she should be having a scene like this, but it's smart to not put it in a movie like this because it would make everything stop. You know, the typical scene of you don't listen to me. My son is being raised. No one's listening to me. All that stuff that that role usually predicts to happen yeah. doesn't happen. And I kind of think that's brilliant. But yeah, I mean, if you look at the the parents of of the quote unquote Nazi kid, you know, she's, she's kind of like just a milk toast woman who, who probably is kind of along for the ride. Whereas her husband is kind of a neutered version of a person because he's never, he's only uh, acquired things and, and been given everything. And he hasn't like struck out on his own to, to generate anything of his own, but is still in a, in a place of privilege and I could see that they're that creating a vacuum for their son and and what's he gonna do? He's gonna seek out some sort of like a male role model or group of male role mo- role models who are confident in their opinions and who are not not worried about uh about offending other people and so he's gonna gravitate towards the crazy uh, whatever the alt alt right confident jerky people are 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 going to be saying on on the internet because that's the confidence he doesn't see in his dad that uh, that's all coming from other people's descriptions of him as a character because he says like five things in the film he barely says anything in this movie half of it is what is him regurgitating what he heard while he was in the bathroom the rest of the time he's just on his phone it's it's an understated performance but it does what it needs to do in, in this case I also wanted to bring up Edie Patterson, who plays Fran. At, you know, she goes; she's the one who discovers the body at the beginning of the film. But I saw her in uh, Vice Principals, and she's now in The Righteous Gemstones. She's one of the children of John Goodman in the HBO show The Righteous Gemstones, and she does a, a really good job. I think we're going to see more from her uh, oh, right. as as yeah. time goes on. And uh, I thought she did for for what she had to do. She did; she was totally fine. And, and, uh, and then we, I also wanted to talk about Frank Oz too. When he came on screen, I leaned over to Steph and I was like, that's Yoda. She was like, what? <laughs> but I didn't know he hasn't been Were in you an Alamo draft house. Yeah. Yeah. I, it was, it was very quiet. <gasps> like, it was right in her ear. Nobody else could hear. Don't tell on me. I would have heard <laughs> it. I'm going to tell on you. But I don't think that he's been in any like live 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 action movies in 20 years or something because even yoda knows that ryan johnson did the right thing for the star wars family well, even yoda knows it if yoda knows it you don't have any argument for me side note how cute is that baby yoda by the way oh my dude. god dude that baby yoda is so cute baby yoda is really cute with this little spacecraft cradle come on now yeah that's ridiculous it's awesome. like it's it's ridiculous Gizmo's pissed. Gizmo's like, <laughs> oh, I was first. And you kind of look like me. Kind of. Yeah, a little anyway, bit. Anyway, so Frank Oz comes out of acting retirement to work with Brian Johnson because he knows he's brilliant. That's right. Are you saying Brian Johnson or Ryan Johnson? I said Ryan Johnson. Okay. Or I right, might have said Brian. That's all right. Brian, but okay. I might have. Knowing me, it could be. <laughs> I'm just overly excited with calling Ryan Johnson brilliant than I might have called brilliant him Ryan, Ryan Johnson. Johnson. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. Bro, no, it doesn't work. No matter how you look at it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I say weird things. I put S's on words that don't exist. Well, you remember Goodfellows? Yeah, Hawks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why do I do that? Um, I figured that one out though, because somebody else is John Hawks. Yes. How did you know that? Yes, I saw um Peanut Butter Falcon. Yeah, and John Hawks is in he that. Is in that? And I'm driving down the road, and I was like. Yeah, and I was like, oh, this is kind of a thankless role that John Hawks have. Oh, I was like, oh, he's John Hawks, and Ethan is Ethan Hawk. Now I got it, finally. 
So I, I before the movie started, of course they play a bunch of trailers, and one of the trailers is the Safdie brothers' new film, Uncut Gems, starring Adam Sandler, who's in a. I know everybody's comparing it to like, this is like Adam Sandler from Punch Drunk Love, and first of all, it's not, but secondly, it is Adam Sandler in a serious role, and I'm sure there's going to be comedy in there and stuff too. But it, it looks interesting. I'm I'll see it in the theater. But uh, like Keith Stanfield's in there, and and he he plays Kevin Garnett's kind of right right hand man, I guess. But but you see him in, in that trailer, and then you see him in this film, and you're just like, what can't this guy do? Like he he can just move in and out of of any any genre or or work with any filmmaker and be completely at ease. So I I think it was awesome that that we get to see him in this film. So that, that was really cool too. I mean, do you want to talk about the, the kind of messages that, that Ryan Johnson is, is kind of trying to portray? I did hear, uh, I did hear an interview that put me somewhat at ease because it did feel like there was, it seemed like there was definitely an opinion that was being put forth by Ryan Johnson about America and the entitlement associated with the family in this film. And that the family in this film representing a group of people in the United States and his dislike for the views of that group of people. But the cool part about it is that he represents not just one side of the political spectrum with this family, but he represents people from both sides of the political spectrum within this family. And they're all jerks. So at least he's, I mean, he's firing salvos at people, but he's firing salvos at people across both sides of the political divide. So at least that's something. Well, the thing that's interesting for me about that is that when anybody spins out of political control, when it comes to opinions, especially characters in movies, people tend to make one side buffoonerish or buffoon-like, and the other side is 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 right you know they don't make both sides in their extreme opinions about something based on fact based on heart based on passion whatever it's based on they always have one side or the other that looks cleaner in this it doesn't happen because tony collette obviously is the one who is on the left for lack of a better term and of course michael shannon's son is on the right and they both look silly when they start to amp up don johnson's on the right too he's hugely on the right he's the one yeah. who's who's kind of coming at tony collette and saying you know this is our land you know which is obviously i mean that's a very complex statement and uh and so yeah you can say that but there are different opinions about that too i guess so you know when things like this happen in movies i question whether or not it was important to the narrative and i because i know a lot of people who are going to be bothered by the sure the um, Hollywood agenda of it and I don't know if it's necessary but I do like the way he handled it when he interjected it it's also topical and sometimes that's really good but in 15 20 40 years from now yes we'll know history but is it going to sound as let's hope it's not depending on what side of the issue you were on um, but you're right yeah Don Johnson is that guy and what's interesting is they never get a chance to make their platform sound reasonable either side yeah and that to me is balancing of the equation if one person sounded more rational than the other even if it was don johnson who said this is our country blah, blah, but, blah. but he so he says this is our country but then at the same time he says they broke the law they need to be held accountable for that that is a rational thought and that is a thought that that can be can be discussed and, and i you know that's not something I don't think that's an irrational thought, but at the same time, the Tony Collette character is saying all of these things and doing the whole virtue signaling thing, saying like, this isn't, you know, this isn't right. But when it comes down to it, she's, she's still groveling by the end of the film and, and f- trying to figure out the way for her to, to keep the money that she has instead of looking at the opportunity that, that Marta has and and being happy for Marta or wanting to take you know or being a good steward of the money that she's been given and you know donating some of it to 
to people who are less fortunate than her or whatever. Like it, it's kind of like she's she may be speaking those words, but not following it up with any kind of actions or or any kind of you know true being truly productive towards helping out the people who she says are she's she feels sorry for so it's just kind of like empty words isn't that what's at the core of all both of those two issues the fact that i'm okay with you doing what you're doing crossing the border or not crossing the border getting arrested not getting arrested as long as you don't touch mine yeah as long as you don't come for what's mine yeah I'm cool with it. And essentially, they're both saying the same thing. Yeah, they're both saying the same yeah, thing. Tony Collette's yeah. saying like, yeah, they're totally fine. But if they just like, hey, for example, if they just move into my house, that's crossing the line. Right. And, and that's exactly right. what Don Johnson's saying. So they're effectively saying the right. same thing, but they're on the opposite opposite sides of the political spectrum. Well, my question would be, although I would never talk to Tony Collette, personally like this but if i was a character in the movie i would be like hey i'll tell you what we're going to charter a plane and we're going to go down to the border and we're going to take lunches to those kids in cages if she said yes and funded it i'd be all about her opinion mm-hmm. if she didn't and said oh well there's people who do things like that which strikes me as what her character would say <laughs> sounds exactly like what or her character would say. if don johnson's character said it's against the law blah 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 and i said okay well no problem let's go down to the border and set up legal teams to help these people legally do this, but you fund it. And he says, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not doing any of that. That's for them to figure out. Then I would have a problem Mm -hmm. with him too. It's like, what are you proactively doing? And yes, I could sit in my little world of comfort and say, I'm not doing any of that myself because I don't have the means that they have, but there's still ways to give back in this world. But to me, I actually... I didn't think it was necessary in this film for that stuff to occur. It didn't bother me, but I don't think it was necessary. I think you got who they were and what they felt almost immediately by their position in the family. Since she is a daughter-in-law who is married to a son who has passed away, she has a certain position in that family. And her daughter is the one who's really the family member per se. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, people say that blood, blood is not necessarily what defines a family, but it strikes me that they made that very clear, very quickly that this was about the daughter. That's why I was kind of surprised to see Tony Collette sleeping there. And the side note, uh, this kind of bothered me just a little bit. I thought to myself, you have this huge house and you all sleep in the same corridor. Come on. I mean, like you sleep underneath the crickety stairs. Like you couldn't go down to, you know, wing B and get your own house next to the garage. I mean, you had to sleep underneath the crickety stairs. Now I get why somebody who is uber rich, like the grandfather, like Christopher Plummer's character, having a small little upstairs attic where it becomes like his man cave and it's small and it's Mm -hmm. confined. I get why somebody in his position would want to have that because all this luxury and stuff is, you don't need it, but it's, you know, it's great to have, but he probably needs some small comforting place. And that doorway says it all. Do you remember the doorway going yeah, into that like upstairs where it's like, I love yeah, that kind really of cool. stuff. And I love the fact that she just has to press the wall and then go up a, a staircase. See, I love that about big houses. I don't want to live in one mm-hmm. because I'm scared to death of haunting of Hill house now, but <laughs> it's, it's a cool place. So I, I like that he interjected it, but it does seem instead of being drawn with really textual colors from his paintbrush, it sounds like it's just like, let me splatter this in really quick and you can take what you want from it. And I'm fine with that because I think Ryan Johnson is a genius, but I don't think it's necessity, a necessity to mm-hmm. make this narrative work. I just don't think it's cool yeah. that it's peppered in, but it's not a necessity for me. I just, I just think the fact that the end shot pays off a lot more because of those previous discussions and you notice that that while like while Don Johnson is saying like I don't have a problem with them just as long as they you know come into the country legally and as he's doing that he's handing his empty plate to her to handing his empty plate to Marta who's a nurse absent-mindedly absent-mindedly exactly so it's like it's not even like he's consciously doing it he's just handing it to her because he just assumes that she's the help because she's from Ecuador or Paraguay or Uruguay or Brazil or whatever that the, at least they know South American countries. I mean, that's a that's a bonus. They know that there are different South American countries. 
So, I mean, you got to give him yeah, some heart credit. Of gold, dude. But anyway. Yeah. I'm, you got to give him some so credit. That's the first two letters of some. That's all you're going to get. Half credit. That's all you're going to get. Yeah. But, I mean, it seems like every movie has bookends or at least the movie. It seems like the movies that, that I'm, I gravitate towards have a certain amount of formalism to them in their structure. And this movie is not any different where it starts off with the shot of the, the coffee cup. And it ends with the shot of her holding the coffee cup, kind of doing a little bit of a reveal. You know, my house, what is it? My house, my rules, something along those lines. My coffee. My yeah. coffee. There we go. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, that that's great. And, and it ends with the the Rolling Stones song. And so I, I, I thought that was that was really cool. But my last question for you is, would you be interested in another Daniel Craig playing Benoit Blanc film in three years or something. When you were talking about that earlier, I was thinking, I don't think so. Here's why. He's such an intricate part of this story for me that he is more than just, has become more than just the detective who figures it out. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like Albert Finney um, and Kenneth Branagh are the detectives who are there to figure it out in the earlier version of Murder on the Orient Express and then the later version of it. They are the detectives that are there to figure it out. Do you need them to have a sympathetic ear to characters? Yeah, I guess you do. But the way that Benoit has for Marta, not really. It's not like meaning it's not like that in those other movies. So for me, this movie seems to be about a family dynamic more than it is about a murder mystery. And Ryan Johnson made that very clear by giving us everything we need to know a third of the way through, or at least that's what you think he's doing. Because I thought to myself, well, what are we here for? You know, what, is this going to be a bunch of flashbacks now? This is dumb. Like, why would you do that? But then I realized how genius it was when it all played the way out. Sure. I didn't think it was dumb because I wouldn't have thought that. But so for me, it's almost like the Benoit character is part of this story. Mm. Am I interested in him functioning in somebody else's story? I have to say, not really. And Mm. that's not to say that I didn't like what Daniel Craig did. I did like what Daniel Craig did. I like seeing people who you expect one thing from one person. It's not that big of a stretch for him to go from James Bond to this. It's not that big of a stretch to be a detective per se, because it's kind of the same mindset, if you will, because you have to figure things out on the fly. And you're, you have a skill set that you've trained for and that you're prepared for and that past history has dictated that you can be this thing in this situation, detective or James Bond. So no, I don't think so. I don't think I need another family's issues being solved by Benoit. That said, if it's smartly done and it's done by Ryan Johnson, then why not? Because yeah. if, he could figure, if he could figure it out, anybody could. If he could figure out bringing Benoit Blanc into a different scenario and making it interesting or even somehow intertwining Marta in the, in the next story, mm-hmm. I have no idea. I, I'm, I'm just, just yeah. came to me. You, you could do all kinds of stuff. That, that does, that is an interesting story. I mean, obviously Marta has now a, 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 a lot of money and she doesn't necessarily owe any of that money to him because he, I don't feel like Benoit as as a detective was willing to necessarily like he knew that she at some point, you know, he knew that she was the one who, you know, who committed the murder quote unquote until he found out that she didn't or until he realized that she didn't for, for obvious reasons. And then, and, and then he was able to do his, his whole spiel and figure it out. So he was at one point completely fine with her admitting her guilt but then the reason why he jumped in was not because he didn't feel like she should have to go to jail because of her situation financially or socially or whatever. It was because she didn't do it. It was it was the the kind of you know legalistic. I'm here to solve this situation. Is it a murder? Is it not a murder? What what how, what's this puzzle that I that I need to figure out? And by him figuring out the puzzle, she was innocent and she was due the money that that was uh, given to her through the will. So it would be interesting to see if, you know, she bankrolls him for 
another thing. You know, he just goes around the the country or goes around the world and figures things out and is bankrolled by her. That would be kind of cool. But I think at the same time, it's it's better if if he gets contracted to do things, and then you get a whole another group of people who are who do a movie for two weeks, and and we get another movie like this. The only way I could see it working for me is the fact that if she does bankroll him, that he asks for her help on some level because at a certain point in the movie, it becomes about them trying to figure it out, not necessarily him yeah. trying to figure it out or trying to accuse her. It's it's about them trying to figure it out yeah. because um, they talk about retracing their steps. I mean, that's yeah. before he really knows or before you know he really knows. So in my opinion, and because she's such a standout, um, what's the actress's name? Ana de Armas. Yes. Um, great name. She's so great that for me, this movie is as imp- is as impressive because of her as it is Daniel Craig, if not more because of her. She becomes a lead character in a movie. You're not expecting her to become a, a lead character. And so it might be interesting if it becomes kind of a team effort type of thing where she becomes like, you know, the funder or the financier of the situation, but also the same time when he can't figure something out, he kind of bounces it off of her. No, I decided, no, we don't you, need another You don't one need another character. one. <laughs> I've decided. <laughs> okay. No, I'm saying that if Ryan Johnson puts his thumbprint on it, then I'm fine. Mm. I'm cool. I'm good. It's going to be interesting. But let me ask you a question. Yeah. Do you think that Marta is going to do the right thing in the long run and help this family out? regardless of how they treated her. And also I did think of another reason why it was kind of semi important to put the issues that we talked about politically into the film, because it affects what happens later on when Michael Shannon comes to her and says, yes. you got to do the right thing. If not, isn't your mother illegal? Then it becomes this He's like, using scary it situation as a weapon. For, so do you think when they're looking up at her, which is a great shot, and they've used it in yes. almost all of the publicity stills, it's a great shot. Jamie Lee Curtis at the center with their cigarette. She's great. Do you think she's going to do the right thing and help them out, or she's done with them? I think that there's definitely going to be some somewhat of a cooling off period, and she'll probably end up seeing who how they comport themselves with no money. And the ones who are able to survive without that money, she may be more receptive to. But yeah, I don't think that she's necessarily going to feel any kind of any kind of requirement to fund everybody's everything. All right, you can check us out on the web at actorandengineer.com. You can go to facebook.com slash actorandengineer. And you can tweet us at actorengineer. And we'll see you next time. 